Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining our drop in session today. I am very delighted to have you joining us. I have with us as our guest speaker today, Matt Sinner from Southern California, working at a very large university hospital there as the lead educator um, and uh, I guess a kind of assistant nurse manager for the vascular access team as a critical care background and has been now using SecureCAF for just over two years. Um, welcome, thank you for joining us. I see we have a few friends today. Um, I'm going to pop up a poll to start our conversation and please feel free to use the chat function in um, the Zoom meeting that we have here going on. Um, so that way you can post your questions and I will moderate your questions. Or if you feel like unmuting, you can do so and ask any questions that you have. So thank you for joining us today. I'm hoping the um, survey is posted. Um, we have a little poll question to kind of get to know you, um, but welcome. Thank you for joining us. I know we're waiting on folks to come in and we're just getting started here. Um, but thank you for joining us today. We're excited to have another SecureCath drop-in session. Um, I will introduce our guest speaker in a minute. I'm just gonna give folks a minute to join us here. It looks like we've got some nice attendance, nice participation. And you see the poll question on your screen, feel free to let us know where you're from. Looks like so far we've got pretty good representation from the large academic acute systems. That's great. And then we have folks, mostly vascular access specialists, some general nurse and infection preventionist. Thank you for joining us. We have folks that have never seen Secure Health before, rarely see it, sometimes see it. So a mixed bag there. If you didn't notice, the poll questions have um, three sections. So just scroll down to get all of the questions. Thanks for joining us this morning. We are recording this session. I will make introductions here. Our guest speaker. Uh, thanks, Christian, for letting us know where you're from. I know you see it sometimes there at UCSF. Um, so great. Good to know um, where you're from today. Thanks. And anybody else wants to share who they are, where they're from, that's great to know too. Please feel free to use the chat function. It's active. It's meant for you guys to use to post questions. If you're being shy, you can post them directly to me or you can post them to the whole group. Either way, I will be moderating this session with our guest speaker here, Matt Sinner. Matt is from Southern California. He works at a large academic center in Southern California, has been using SecureCAF for a couple of years now, and um, really excited for him to share some of his knowledge and experience. Matt works as a vascular access nurse educator for the health system. He's an expert for his health system, runs trainings both with nursing students, new hires, and um, anybody on the team. He is uh, stays on top of the literature, is very, very savvy, and uh, ensures that his team is functioning at the top of their um, license. They have a fantastic team at his facility. I won't go into naming names, but um, they are awesome. I've had a chance to work with them personally. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Just a little bit of ground game and ground rules. Uh, if you haven't already filled out the, the poll online, I'm going to, I'm going to keep it open for a little bit and then close it. Um, once you fill it out, you can hit close on your screen. So it's not in your way. Um, we will be answering your questions. So feel free to post those questions in the chat, or you can unmute and ask the question directly. We welcome you to do that. If you don't ask questions, then you have to listen to the questions I ask, which can be boring, but you're more than welcome to let me do that too. <laughs> then it's just a conversation between me and Matt, and you guys get to hear that. Um, but please, please feel free to post any questions that you have, anything you've heard about or seen. Um, and if you're just curious, we'll kind of get started here with um, some generic questions. So Matt, yeah, when you first started using secure cath at your institution and your team was learning how to use it, what would you say the biggest um, area of opportunity for learning? What was the hardest thing for people to learn about? You know, I think that in terms of the care and maintenance piece, when people are learning that, um, just how the device even works itself, you know, uh, people are want to know, um, you know, how, how do I need a adhesive securement device with this device uh, or not, right? Um, do uh, some of the questions that we had are like, you know, how do I do a dressing change with this device now? 
Um, do I still use glue? You know, all, all of these questions, uh, tissue adhesive um, with with the product. Um, and does it stay? Does it stay there? Do I have to change it every dressing? Um, just like we do with adhesive securement devices. And so some of the, th those are some of the questions and the things that um, that we had to teach to and like help people understand when using this product, when using SecureCath um, and how to, um, you know, how all of those other pieces and the dressing change process fit in with SecureCath, so. Awesome. So when um, you teach your, colleagues or new hires about a dressing change, do you want to kind of, or let me actually start, we're going to start with removal first. So we're going to start with the back end and we're going to work backwards to the beginning. Yeah. Um, how would you, if you saw a patient, the patients come to you, you've got an order to take this pick line out, walk our audience through how you take a secure cap out at the end of need and what you assess and how you go about that. All right, so I'm going to just switch my boards here real quick. I got a, a little extra board here. Um, and so secure cath removal, right? Um, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, our team will get called to help with secure cath removals. Um, most of the time we have champions that have been trained on our units that are removing secure caths. Um, and so what the process looks like and how it works, right, is that uh, there's, two, there's two pieces really to the secure cath. And I'm just going to demonstrate what those look like, right? There's the lid. And then there's the bottom base piece, okay? Um, and so with removal, um, what you're going to do is just, uh, there's, there, I like to always point out two different things on the secure cath. There's a hold piece and a lift piece, okay? And it might be hard to see on this camera, on this uh, angle here, but on, on both sides, there's, uh, there's uh, printed and printed lift and hold, okay? And so how I was trained and taught is that when you're removing the device, you want to support it when you take the lid off. Okay. And so what that looks like is that you're going to place your finger underneath the device and you're going to put your thumb where it says hold. You're going to use your opposite hand to um, lift where it says lift, right? But I always put a little bit of pressure with my thumb down onto my index finger so that it, it um, stabilizes the device. And then I lift up with uh, my index finger to take the lid off, right? Um, and now at this point there, I mean, you have really two options. There's removal of the catheter first prior to removal of the secure cath or if you, um, or, or leaving the catheter and removing the secure cath first. But the main principle is that when you do remove the secure cath is that um, it's important to know how the device looks and what, what, what it looks like, okay? And so I like to take it out just to show what the device looks like in the subcutaneous tissue, right? It has these two uh, feet that we call that uh, are placed into the insertion area, you know, the and um, they help, that's what helps secure it, right? Now, when you are removing it, it's important to understand the, like the anatomy of where those feet lie, okay? And the reason I say that is that if you don't, um, if, if you try to, uh, remove it with uh, without using the proper technique, then it's going to be more challenging for you, right? And so how I teach you is that when you are removing the device, right, you're going to take the catheter out of the device. Um, the catheter has this blue channel, and in this blue channel, it allows you to fold the device itself. And so if you can see here, I'm folding the device, right? And so when you fold the device, um, it uh, brings the feet. Here, I'll just bring it out here. It brings the feet together. So when the feet are brought together, they kind of create almost a, a you know an angle. Now, when you are removing the device after you folded it, uh, I always like to say bring the blue part as parallel with the skin as possible. Once you've done that, then you're going to uh, what what I say is lift up with a purpose, right? And lifting up with a purpose will allow you to bring the feet straight out for that device and for the um, and. And the reason why I say parallel, right, is that if um, if you are not parallel, right, um, the the feet uh, will not be in alignment with the insertion, and so that's why we say make it parallel with the skin so that it will be removed that way. So, yeah, and I I agree with you 100%, Matt. I think the most common mistake I see with early users is that they're pinching the wing with two fingers versus the three finger approach you demonstrated. And they turn the blue, so the blue ridge is in is perpendicular to the insertion site, which ends up putting those toes and feet 
under the skin and, and acting as a hook. And we don't want that fish hook effect. <laughs> we don't like fish hooks. <laughs> so uh, do you uh, mind? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, while you have that out, can you show the to the camera the feet and the and the ball and the shape? Can you just describe yeah. that for everyone? That's what I was going to say when you say fish hook. It's not sharp, right? <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> the the feet of the device are actually. Um, let's see if it, it gets better. Better. Uh... Actually, I think with the camera, the down camera, you have the background. So yeah, you okay. can see it. Yep. So the, 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 the feet themselves have, uh, they're rounded on the ends, right? And, and so there's no um, hooking necessarily per se. Um, they are designed to um, be blunt here at the end, right? So that's what, that's what the feet look like. And then when you fold it, you know, you can see that there's the T shape, but when you fold it, then it turns into an L shape. Great. And I'm looking if our audience has any questions. I'm happy to ask them for you. You can send me a direct message through the chat or you can post it for the audience to see your questions. Um, if you're shy, that's fine. If you'd like to ask your question directly, please unmute and feel free to jump in. I see Alyssa. Hi, Alyssa. Hi, good morning. Um, I have a question about the bio patch. So yeah. when I initially got education on this, um, the bio patch, we were taught to use the smaller size bio patch, like the infant size. Um, but now I've seen the larger, like the adult size bio patch being used. And then we've also seen the bio patch being just laid on top versus being wrapped around. Um, so I just want to clarify the best so size I, bio patch I, to be used and then to ensure that we are supposed to be wrapping it underneath the secure calf. Absolutely. So I'll I'll answer the size question for you. Um, so the size catheter that you're placing in the patient should match the bio patches labeled recommendations for the size bio patch. I believe, and I'm don't quote me on this, but I believe like the four French is sort of where it shifts between the two sizes. It might be the five French. So if you're using a three or a four French catheter, you should use the smaller size. If you're using a five French and larger, it's it's the, the middle size. And then they have a larger one with a bigger hole for the dialysis catheters. Now I know supply chain might have been a reason you might have saw variation in those sizes. I've seen that happen in hospitals where it's better to put something on than nothing. Um, and so I would just make sure you've got the vendor for BioPatch has a chart and it tells you which catheters fall under which device. So it's really more about the outer diameter of the catheter. Secure catheter doesn't um, affect that. So the size of the catheter you're using, um, secure cap is only two millimeters in, in around, and you want to put that bio patch all the way around so you're protecting the entire insertion site. So I, I, I'll let Matt demonstrate exactly how to apply it with his demo pad. Yeah. So, right. You have your secure cap in place. We have our uh, bio patch, right? And so the slit is going to go around the catheter just like you would and it's supposed to be at an offset about a 10 degree offset right and so we're going to place it all the way around the catheter itself lifting it up here right and and when we lift our secure cath whenever you're you know have it like a hinge normally is it how we're going to say and, and teach to and then a slight offset with the slit on the on the bio patch about 10 degrees and then all the way around the site does it does that help and answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because um, what what I had learned previously was like if you use the larger one, that it could create too much of a a hinge and pressure could cause pressure injury. So that's why we went with the smaller one. So this clarifies that definitely. Um, and then just sometimes when I do rounding, I see the bio patch just laid on top altogether. So then it's like okay, we need to just provide education with those particular, you know, dressing changes to make sure that nurses understand that it needs to go totally around. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, education is a huge piece, right, with any product implementation. Um, and, and in the beginning, we kind of talked about how does this product interact with other products that we're using? And, and incorporating those pieces into education is really helpful in order for users to um, understand and use all the products as they should be used with each other for sure so good Great. good thank you
And on our website, um, too, there are great training resources specific to the different combinations of products. We tried to get as many variations of that. So for those that are using Biopatch, there's a Biopatch video. And for those that are using maybe the Tegaderm CHG product, there's a video for that as well. So um, you'll see different, like there's just a plain dressing. There's, again, there's diff there's about four different. The, the content is really focused on SecureCath, but it shows how to use those different um, those different devices or different dressings with um, with our device so that we're trying to teach the two together. So if you need any of those resources or links, you can send me a private direct message and, and in the chat and I will make sure my team follows up with you. Yeah. And, Are there and, any other questions? Go well, ahead. I, I received a direct message. This one, this one comes from Josie and mm -hmm. uh, it says, okay. Does it have an antibiotic coating? So Josie, I have a question for you. What is it exactly you're referring to um, when you ask if it has an antibiotic coating? Uh, you can come off mute or you can just put it in the chat um, so that maybe we can better answer that question for you. So this catheter stays on for the length of the treatment, correct? Oh, because, okay. I mean, I'm sorry. This device stays on for the length of the um, treatment, correct? Right. Right. It so, doesn't get things. Correct. Yeah, so, so you, when we do our dressing changes and we, you know, cleanse with chlorhexidine, um, does the device itself have an antibiotic coating on it? Um, or no, it doesn't. No, I no. see Laura. Want me to, her head. Yeah. Do you want me to answer that, Matt? Or do you want oh, me yeah, to go, go for ahead, it? Go ahead. Okay, so the device itself doesn't have any special coatings. I will say that nitinol, the, the metal aspect, which is the, what is subcutaneous and at the at, parallel to the insertion site, is um, known to, nickel in itself has, is known to have antimicrobial properties, but we're not making any antimicrobial claims. We do have a fantastic study if you're concerned about infection and infection prevention, because the real benefit is a mechanical aspect of infection. Okay protection in that we go in and anchor at the insertion site and prevent the catheter from moving during routine dressing changes. It also allows, and I'll let Matt demonstrate this because he's got his pad up, but it allows you to lift it up and clean 360 degrees around with your antimicrobial um, skin antisepsis, and that gets a much more effective clean. When you try to do that with um, a dressing that is coming off, with securement that's coming off, your catheter is either moving in and out or it's not getting an effective clean all the way around. And so I'll let Matt kind of take over like why SecureCath has a lower risk of infection compared to the alternatives. Yeah, and, and I, I like that you asked if it has antibiotic coating, right? Um, the, the great thing, and and when I teach, uh, you know, so I teach our new grads, um, new nurses to the institution, like how we do dressing changes. And when they see this device and they're like, I can, oh, I can lift it up and I don't have to worry about it coming out is like a huge benefit, right? But also allowing for that cleaning all the way 360 around the device is huge. Um, without that that worry of like, am I accidentally going to dislodge my catheter? Um, and so anyways, lifting it up like a hinge, I always like to say is the way that you're going to, you know, lift it up um, so that you can do the 360 uh, clean around it. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah, welcome. And can you... Can you do me a favor, Matt? Try to do a, a lift and hinge with your um, stat lock. I have a video I'm going to try to pull up here. Okay. See, oh, let's see if I can. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right, uh, the 360 lift here, right? I, I, these these catheters are uh, secured here in the foam on the backside, so it makes it a little bit more secure. But, uh, you know, in a real patient, you're if you were doing this lift and pull, like any kind of movement from your patient's arm, right? Like, ah, it could potentially, you know, potential for dislodgement always. But um, at this point, you're not secure with your catheter, but I mean, you could do your 360 lift, but I would be really concerned with accidentally dislodging it at this point. So for sure. But you can see as I go to put my catheter back in, it's like, oh, it doesn't look quite the same. And maybe it um, came out. Jeff, I'm finding the, the you know what video I'm looking for, Jeff. Do you have it at your fingertips? Because I'm finding it hard to locate. Hang I wanted on. to show the. Okay, thank you. <laughs> There's a video which was shared with us um, of a dressing change, and you can see how difficult it really is to, at the micro level to keep the catheter from moving in and out if it's not anchored right at that insertion site. And so um, I've asked him to pull that out. 
Um, I got a question online while he's pulling that out. Um, the, uh, while he's pulling that video up, Megan um, asks, uh, what is the recommended dwell time for the secure cast? Yeah, and, I, and I'll take that, uh, Laura. So, Megan, what we've seen in um, our patient populations that we, when we're using the secure cath, is that it's going to stay for the life of the line. Um, you know, with your adhesive securement devices, you're changing them with every dressing change. Um, but with the secure cath, it's going to stay with the life of the line. So, it's not going to be taken out um, until the catheter would be removed. And I and I think that there are some cases of that they've had them, Laura. Uh, for how long? What's the longest secure cath that we've long? I was just I was just about to post that in the chat too. Is the longest case study that's been published is five years. It was presented at Ava this year, um, and it was actually on a chest tunnel line. Um, I'm just posting a link to that particular poster that was shared. Um, but yeah, five years with a single device, a non cuff tunneled catheter in a TPN patient, um, and so th that that one was the longest that we have documented. Now there's several studies on our, our peer review publications that have dwelled times well over two years. And again, pick lines tend to dwell anywhere from six weeks to six months, sometimes, you know, years if necessary. And secure cap can be one device that secures it from the beginning to end. I see that Jeff's sharing his screen. Is everybody seeing that on the audience? I can see it. All right. I'm Great. I'm going to narrate this just so you know, but what you see on one side of your screen is a catheter that had um, a, an adhesive securement device it was removed and they're disinfecting it um, at the insertion site. And you can see as they're moving it, that dot, which is, you know, literally only a millimeter is going in and out of the skin at that insertion site. And through the course of that few second video, it went in and out at the surface of the skin more than five times. Um, I'm going to ask him to loop it one more time because it's hard to watch two screens at once. Um, so on the right side of your screen, if you focus there this time, what you'll notice is the same cleaning is happening in parallel side by side. Um, they're lifting up this IJ line and um, you're not changing the device, right? So you're still keeping that device anchored through the entire cleaning process. You have a centimeter from the insertion site to the base of the secure cap that lets you to clean all the way around that catheter. And you can see as they did their scrub, it's it's clipped, but you, as they do their scrub, that catheter is not pistoning in, in and out. Um, and I think it's really important that we understand that the movement of that, even if it's only a millimeter or a micrometer, you're, it's not what's happening at the surface of the skin where you're cleaning, it's in that layers deeper because the chlorhexidine on the surface of the skin is not eliminating microbes in that at deeper tissue. And that's what's moving in and out into your vein tract. And so that's where our concern for infection comes from like through the five sources of infection. I see Christian has his hand up. Please feel free to unmute and ask your question. Um, so I was just gonna, um kind of speak to a practice that I use. Um, the, the young lady had asked about um, like if there was an antimicrobial layer on the secure cat. So the issue, when I very first saw this product, of course, my first concern, we use um, the uh, quick stick CHGs that you like crack. And it's like, it's almost like a, it's sort of a lot of surgeons use in the OR where you like essentially paint um, and it's a handheld device as opposed to a swab stick. So what I started doing, because the first one I did at like mid change, I'm like, dude, how am I going to clean the underside of this, of this secure cat device? Like I've, it, I haven't seen it. I've, I haven't done it. Um, and basically I just throw swab sticks on my field and I almost will, I'll get a second person to um, apply top pressure um, on top of that secure cat with like sterile gloves. And I take a swab stick and basically scrub the underside of the secure cath. Um, and we do the same thing too in practice with our, our cuffed or uncuffed lines that we're using um, right. like an adhesive securement device with. Um, we'll put a piece of, you know, essentially a sterile gauze and have somebody apply direct pressure on the insertion site um, with full circumferential um, pressure around the arm or if it's the chest, obviously you can't do that. But we, we found that using those swab sticks, you can get, I mean, you can get very, very close to the insertion as opposed to the, that uh, quick stick, but that's what I use because I, I had kind of the fear of like, I don't know if this thing's coded. I don't know if it's impregnated. How can I clean under it? Because I want to make sure I'm getting everything possible. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I think, Matt, if you can demonstrate that lift again, I think that. Um, and the great thing, you know, you're talking about getting sterile gauze, extra supplies and putting it on the site in order to make sure when you don't have 
you know, a secure cath to be able to clean 360, right? Um, when you have the secure cath, it's, it's this lift, right? It's, I'm going to be able to lift up. I can take my swab and, and clean the backside of it. I'm going to bring it up to this 90 degree angle. And that allows me the backside clean and underneath of where the secure cath goes all around the insertion site. Um, and so, yeah, that, I mean, that, that 360 cleaning is, is a real, real game game changer without having to worry about that dislodgement piece. And Matt, you know, I, I, I think, you know, this, this, there's a second reason why lifting secure cath is important during dressing changes, because it makes removal easier, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. So for long dwelling lines, we've learned that if you lift it and you do do that 360 scrub all the way around the secure cap, you reduce the tissue adhesion that might happen if the device is staying too still. So when if because of this anchoring below the subcutaneous tissue, sometimes we'll find that it has some tissue growth or granulation to reduce that from happening if you're actually lifting it during each dressing change and you get that 90 degree lift and scrub, you don't see as much tissue adhesion. And then I believe that that really makes it easier for removal on our longer dermal lines. Now, are there any other questions? I'm looking for comments or posts. Feel free again to message us. Thanks, Christian. That was a great comment. And I thank you for sharing your experience with us. Um, other folks can please comment if you need to raise your hand or unmute. It's an open chat, open forum. I'm going to give it a second. And if not, I'm going to ask Matt another question. Matt, what do you do when a patient has um, like skin irritation? Like maybe they, they already had a line come in from outside your hospital and the skin is all broken down. How do you manage that in your, your hospital setting? Okay. Um... Well, in terms of skin breakdown, right? Um, sometimes we'll see that, especially in our peds populations, that um, people are in a hurry when they do skin antisepsis. And they might be in a hurry, one, because they're worried about dislodging the line, but two, um, they, the kid may be moving around and crazy when they're doing their dressing changes, right? Um, some of the things that we do if we have identified um, skin irritation and... Um, for these patients um, is that we're going to change our skin antisepsis agents for these patients. Generally, um, we're going to ensure that we're using um, skin protectant for these patients when we are applying dressings. Um, we will generally choose either a low tack or a um, a uh, a foam a foam dressing that will be helpful um, for these patients. Uh, not foam. I'm sorry, silicone dressing. Um, in order to help reduce some of the skin irritation that can come from alcohol-based cleansing solutions. Um, and so, yeah, those are some of the things that we would do for patients that have um, skin irritation um, when we have had, uh, you know, when we identify that in our patients, so. Right, awesome. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, challenges in terms of communicating you mentioned earlier when we first started this call about education um can you provide me you know insights into some tips and tricks into how you've managed education um at your institution right and so you know any any kind of any kind of product implementation a new product is always going to require um right initial education um that covers the basis but then after you've done your initial education, you're always going to find areas that have like, okay, maybe we've, we've seen this challenge, right? Um, one of the things that we saw when we first implemented it is that when people would put their dressings on, right? Um, they would, let's just say that this is the dressing here. They would, they would, they would leave the, the, the base of the catheter out, the hub of the catheter, right? Um, and so, you know, doing through doing like rounding on the patients and hearing the experiences of the nurses, we're like, okay, well, hey, let's let's tell our patients instead of doing that, we're going to increase securement with our dressings, and we're going to make sure that we cover the hub of the catheter to include that underneath the dressing, right? And that's going to help with uh, the uh, with these patients and making sure that the catheter is staying in the right spot. Um, and you know, just hearing the people and what what um, what potential challenges they're having, and then working with secure cath, like we were, when we implemented um, anything that, you know, we had like a concern about, or we um, wanted to ask a question, you know, um, 
Secure Cath's team was always really helpful in being able to answer those questions um, quickly and promptly, right? And, you know, there was two, I think two rounds of education that I did post implementation um, that was, that allowed us to address any of the issues that we saw um, and uh, really combat them so that we wouldn't see them anymore, right? Um, and so really education is just the key in order to have a successful implementation of SecureCath and really any other products, so. Yeah, I think um, that, you know, one of the things I think you've done that not everybody has done and mainly because it's a newer feature um, from, from our company is implemented the e-learning before we implemented at your institution. So right. your um, e-learning infrastructure was solid and having launched that ahead of the in-servicing made the in-servicing a lot more attentive and engaging. So some of the deeper details and technique were able to be covered rather than that first initial in-servicing being the first time many people saw it. I think, um, so for folks on the call that might be existing users and have used it for years, one thing I will quickly show on the screen is some of our e-learning e e resources. I'm just gonna quick share my screen here. Um, and, and while you're sharing that, I just want to just add on is that, right, that piece is really important. The e-learning piece is helpful for yep. to staff to one, increase awareness of the product that's going to happen. But then, you know, incorporating education into, um, so like for our central line dressing competencies that we do at the hospital, incorporating the devices that we use into that education so that there's ongoing awareness and education about the products. And then anytime that we have new new people come in and are taught about central line dressing changes, um, we teach about secure cath. You know, we teach about the three different types of securement devices, but we teach to secure a cath and how to properly use it and maintain it when we have them in place. So that's one big helpful piece as well. Yep, and this is the website. So if you're not familiar, just go to securecath.com. And under clinician resources is our library of tools. If you scroll down to the education link, that's where you can access our e-learning platform. If you'd like to preview the content of that platform, you can click here and create a registration profile. So it, uh, you'll see, you'll go here and create your own profile. Um, if you're you're aware of it or you've gone through it and you like it, but you want it to be launched through your hospital's platform, it's as simple as clicking this link and a form will pop up, fill in this form, and you'll be able to download those resources right away. And thanks everybody for joining our drop-in call today because because of these programs have been such a success, we've actually posted historical recordings and today's session will also be posted. And we're going to continue doing them on a monthly basis. So we'll have our future sessions on this link for discussions, questions, and interactions like this. So thank you all for participating. We really welcome that. But one more feature we have added to our education page on our website is an on-demand in service. So if you're team or your group has maybe some new staff members and you want to just engage with our um, SecureCAF colleagues, you can go click that link and pick a 15-minute overview, a 30-minute meeting. Um, if you're looking just for an overall presentation with maybe your physician group, all of those meetings can be scheduled right on a click of a link. So that's just um, a new set of features that we've added to the website recently, and I wanted to share that with you. We also have all of our printable materials. So again, if you're part of your training or you have colleagues that handle the training, you can redirect them here. And these are all available on, in print. And we can also connect you with your local rep to make sure that they can bring you some copies of that. One of my favorite um, features is our app and you have links to download it on either an Android or Google device or an Apple um, device with the Apple app store. So the beauty of that app is that the hotline number is programmed right in. So you can always um, ask for on-demand help if you don't have time to wait for a scheduled meeting and you need an answer right away on something. Our 800 number, which is right here or through the app, um, has a fantastic team of folks, um, of one of which I see is on our call today. Steve, thanks. Shout out to Steve Wilson, who answers our hotline and um, supports us for on-demand questions. And so, again, that's a great resource both for those in the community outside of your hospitals and for um, any um, burning questions that come up in the moment that you need an answer to. We're happy to answer 24-7. Um, has the CHG gel caused any issues with melting onto the catheter? And Matt, I think you use that CHG dressing in your hospital. Do you want to answer that? 
Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so we've used the CHG gel dressing for like a really long time. Um, but when we have implemented with SecureCath, we have not seen any uh, any melting issues. I mean, the only issues that we see, and it's not has nothing to do with SecureCath, is that people don't, as they're commenting in the chat, they don't like allowing the the chlor prep or the skin prep to dry prior to a dry dressing application, and sometimes we do see um, you know uh, an irritation on the skin, um, which we had talked about earlier. But no, I haven't seen any gel issues with the SecureCath. No, we, and we have no reported issues of the two products being incompatible. I would say the biggest thing I see in my education is the knowing how to remove that dressing properly. Um, and maybe you want to comment on that. There is a trick that's in 3M's training and we, we reinforce every time we see this dressing in the setting. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So anytime that we teach to removing, you know, a dressing, right, we're going to use adhesive removers on the outside of the dressing. Once we get to the gel pad, though, that's the that's the key is that using sterile using sterile saline and, and allowing that to help release the CHG is part of the removal process for a CHG dressing. And we always teach to that because it decreases yeah. the sticky. And I don't know if you've ever, you know, some people might not have used it, but the CHG gel is very, very, very sticky. And so using that saline to help release it is is really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And and 3M has that in their instructions for use as well. There's actually two um, two styles of dressing too. I'll, I'll mention that 3M has a um, new, it, it's actually not new. It's it, They launched it when they originally launched that dressing, but it's a port design where it's a separate gel pad for the CHG, which looks a lot more functions a lot more like the bio patch and that it goes all the way around and under. So if you're if you're having some issues with gel sticking um, to the device or, or re having residual gel on the SecuraCath, what you could do is consider trialing that version of the same product. Um, and it, it basically goes on and then you put a, a standard dressing on top of it or the 3M dressing on top of it. Um, 3M just launched that as a separate two piece um, element. So it's not just for ports anymore. They're, they're recommending it for use with any catheter. And we see that working really well in conjunction with getting it under and around the secure cath. Um, oh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for posting that. That's exactly what I wanted to show. But um, the standard dressing works great with the secure cath. And I think the biggest thing is removal. If you don't use sterile saline um, to get that lift on the gel, they're, they're, the gel pad is very, very sticky. And so it does tend to stick, but that the saline gets it off beautifully. Yeah, and, and and speaking from experience, we've seen that for sure. Thank you, Judy. Judy has a couple comments on saline works well. So thanks for reinforcing that. And that you recommend if you're oh if you're free to unmute, um, you mentioned Aquacell AG underneath works well when CHG is contraindicated. Um, I, I've heard that a couple of times. Maybe you want to share? Yeah, we've uh, needed to do that at our facility um, a couple of times. One when um, you know the, the the CHG was contraindicated, so we would just cut. It's a, like a little two by two. We cut a slit and use it in the same manner that you would with that port um, CHG gel. Um, and it also is um, you know kind of a nice padding underneath. We're we're pediatrics here, and so um, sometimes that um, secure cath may sit kind of funny on their teeny little arm or something, and it, it's nice uh, for padding, so there's no pressure points. Great, excellent. Thank you for that suggestion. Yes, absolutely. When our anatomy is a little bit um, geometrically um, difficult to manage with our three centimeters, it is great to get creative and and use stuff to to make sure that you have the right angles and right stability of the secure cast. So um, Aquacell AG is an option. Great to hear. I, I've seen Mepilax or other versions of um, like a. a sterile pad dressing put underneath to kind of wedge it up if the angle is is a difficult angle on a smaller anatomy or smaller arm or a cachectic patient or senior that may have you know very very um limited geometry to their arm you know the landscape is not allowing the wings to sit sit properly so thanks that's a great one any other questions or comments feel free go ahead lana is it lana am i saying that it's Judy. I just wanted to add something with the Aquacell AG. I talked to the manufacturer and they yes. do not recommend um, 
activating it with any saline. So like that dressing is usually used for wounds. And so there's times when it's for a wound that they um, activate it with saline. Um, for, for our purposes, you do not activate it with okay. saline. That's interesting. Thank you for that added, added recommendation. I'll have to look into that too to add to our library. Thank you so much. Lana, go yeah. ahead. So my question is, um, have you guys seen any um, pressure injuries? Like you said, you guys would, you know, if if the geo, uh, if the, the patient's tiny or bony or whatever, you might want to pad the, the bottom. But have you guys actually seen pressure injuries from the Sakura cap? Yeah, and Matt, Laura, do you want to address that for? Yeah, so you know, we uh, at, at, in my experience, we've had um, we we place on adults and pediatrics, right? Um, and if there is um, any time, whether it's secure cath or not, uh, something that's placed in an area that it gets extra pressure, there's always a risk, right? And so um, ensuring that you're using the zone of insertion method to place catheters and not putting things in areas of flexion or extension or that will increase the amount of pressure um, will, um, will allow you to utilize this device and not to see that, right? But it's education thing. I mean, because like this is the same for PIVs in my institution, right? People put PIVs underneath restraints and then they put a restraint on top of it. And what happens? they get a pressure injury because they're constantly trying to pull it, right? And so that can happen with any device. Um, but in terms of secure cath and making sure that you're using it, you know, away from the areas of flexion or extension, because if the kid is constantly doing this and they're applying extra pressure, whether that's on the catheter, the secure cath, whatever it is, there's always a risk of a pressure injury. And I'll add, you know, I review every every concern reported to our company related to the device because I have a vested interest in ensuring we have a safe and effective product. Um, I will tell you that when we've seen anything reported associated with SecureCath, there's generally been information that tells us there was added pressure to it. Either that you can see in the skin itself that there were serrations from the dressing being stretched and you'll get that kind of effect of the pressure was being put on by the dressing itself. So again, in your patients that you're concerned about pressure injury, proper placement, proper orientation, which we teach as part of our orientation to the device and um, ensuring that there isn't excess stretch on the dressing itself or um, anything added on top, like he said, restraints, uh, BP cuffs, these are all things that are part of uh, obvious. Like I hate to say it's so obvious, we, we know better, but it's not always obvious to the new nurse that just came out of nursing school. So we just need to be diligent, ensure that that proper information and training is there. If a patient already has skin injury, we find that our device is preferred because it's difficult to put an adhesive device or even sutures in an area where the skin is already broken down. And so there's a lot of strategies to ensure that you, if you've got broken skin in the area of the dressing, how to manage that. And you can do so very effectively with the secure cap by, by using some of these strategies to protect the skin in that area. Um, and again, you can engage wound care as well. So again, the, 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 having a good solid plan and having your team, if you've got a patient that has extreme skin conditions, um, we've, we've got some research also on patients with EB and using secure cath that have had great results. So again, we know that it works in some of the most extreme conditions. It's all about setting it up for success and having the right education. So um, I can't tell you that it's never been associated with a pressure injury, but when we've seen them, it is because there was other uh, environmental circumstances that contributed to excess pressure and we need to avoid that. All right. Did that, that help answer your question? Yes, very much. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, I got your message, so I'm going to, I'll answer you back to uh, in the direct messages. Um, is, is there any other questions? Anybody else want to unmute and chime in here? We've got a few more minutes left and this has been a great conversation. Thanks everybody for your engagement. Well, Matt, let me ask you another question. All right. Have you ever considered using secure cath in something other than a pick line? <laughs> uh, well, you know, we we uh, considered uh, in central lines. 
Huh? And um, my hope is to eventually move to that and using it and utilizing it for central lines, but it's all about uh, getting the correct buy-in from the right people um, to be able to have a, a successful implementation in that way. Um, and we had used it in drain management as well um, in from our interventional radiology population. And so these are all um, potential things that um, that we had looked at at our institution when we implemented as well. So, so yeah, there are other things for sure. <laughs> tubes. Yeah, tubes. That's the beauty of this device. So for those who may be new or just learning about it, it goes from three French all the way up to 12 French in device size. And we've been successfully used on devices as small as 2.6 and we go as large as 12.5. We're seeing increased use in, in new clinical applications, such as drainage catheters and um, central lines and seeing really, really good success. It's an, it's an adventure when we get to learn about it being used in new applications. There's actually a study out of Italy on um, ventriculostomy. So anybody who's in critical care, you know, it's, it's insane to see, you know, how many tubes go in your patients in a critical care setting or in a trauma hospital. Um, if you've got tubes, this device really does a great job of holding without putting extra holes in your hand. I think when we all have kind of taken this oath of do no harm, you know, we put an extra hole in a patient, we're breaching the skin, it's our barrier to infection. With SecureCath, we have the opportunity to um, avert that and hold these devices in for a really, really, really long time. We have a great library of evidence on our website too. Um, so if you're like me and nerd out on data, feel free to go to our website and visit um, the clinical evidence page and look for information there. If you're interested in um, working together on a white paper or data collection, I'm happy to get in touch with you offline. I'd love that. Matt and I are going to, I think I'm going to poke him for another project. I, I'm dying to work with him more. So um, I think we can get some amazing data from all of the, the lines you place there. Um, any other questions? I'm going to open it up. We've got a few minutes. Lana, is it? Am I saying Lana? Because I'm yes, guessing. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> so, um, have do you guys have like any um information? Like, how long has someone had a secure cat in them? Well, that's great good. question. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We the <laughs> longest earlier. <laughs> we we did touch on it earlier, but it's okay because people good. jump in and out at different times. I came in late. No, that's okay. That's okay. Go ahead, Matt. I'll let you handle it. Oh, okay. No, no, no. So yeah. Um, so Lana, the device is, is, is designed and made to be with the life of the line. Right. And so, um, for our pick populations, it, it will be staying in until the line is removed. Um, there have been, and, 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 uh, Laura has the direct links for the article at the case study that was reviewed, but there was one that had been, uh, been in for uh, up to five years and that was on a, a, a drain, right? No, no, a tunneled line, actually. Oh, a tunneled a, a line, chest, I'm sorry. A tunneled line. Non, non, yes, it was a non-cuffed tunneled line. So they they are a TPN, lifetime TPN patient. And I just posted the link again for the details. But um, it's the longest known, um, our longest known secure cath. I think four years was the prior one. I knew the patient personally, and she too is a TPN patient. Um, and so that was, that. you know, four years I thought was amazing. Five years was even better. So the, this particular hospital, when they told us they had had the same patient with the same secure cath and same catheter for five years, we we begged them to to put the information out there, and they presented it at Ava this year. So uh, I just posted a copy of that poster on the web on the chat meeting chat. Yeah, and and just to touch on that that point, right? And maybe for some of them people that haven't um, that jumped on a little bit later, um, but the device itself, like uh, when when I do all of my new grad teachings for all of the new people that get hired into our institution, um, and they see this device, right? I always ask, like, hey, have you had an opportunity to do a dressing change, and what where are your thoughts and experiences about doing dressing changes? And I always get like, I'm scared. I'm going to pull the catheter out, right? Um, and so anyways, you know, to that point, when you have the secure cath in, it, it, it um, increases the user's confidence for sure and able to be able to perform a dressing change without dislodging the catheter. So I always like, I always like to say that. I, I, I'm sorry, I seem like I have all the questions. And then we jumped in late. Sorry. Boo. Oh, no, it's good. Uh, but, you know, when I tell people about uh, dressing changes and, and how to handle the catheter, um, I, I'm asking them to really just lift it that 90 degrees and really avoid doing any twisting motion, um, right? Okay. Sure. 
Yes, yes. Oh, I'm sorry if I demonstrated something that was a little bit different than that. But yes, up to 90 degrees, right? And just like I always say, just like a hinge, right? And so you're just going to lift it up, which will allow you to do the cleaning around on the backside um, so that, you know, you can and, and then putting it back down in the same orientation. So like when you do your dressing changes, right? You wanna make sure that you're not changing the orientation. So you're not turning it side to side when you're doing the dressing changes. And for sure, when you, when you take your dressing off, making sure that you're taking note of that um, so that you can put it back down in the same orientation for your patient. Um, and then also making sure, one of the things I always like to teach too, is that when you're doing your dressing changes to ensure that the catheter hasn't rotated around. Sometimes what can happen is that when you have lines attached to it, IV tubing, and you take the dressing off, it can rotate. And so just making sure that the dots, you can see it here on this one, that the dots are aligned in the upward fashion so that you can make sure that the, the catheter stays in alignment. So I always like to point that out in, in teaching as well. So good point. Right, so that's so what you're saying is that the, because it's in a channel so that it, there is a possibility that it can rotate internally. Uh, and so underneath the, the no. wow. So what, what can I happen think it's, is, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead, Matt. Oh, so it's not that, so right, it is secure here, right? But at this point on, there's always a potential that it can rotate around, right? And so that's just one of the teaching points that I always like to ensure and teach to, right, is that when you do your dressing change, make sure that the dots on the catheter are aligned on the top so that you can see them, right? And they're not wrapping around the catheter. And that can happen. Um, and so uh, just to make sure that the alignment is in place so that uh, it stays uh, stays how it's supposed to in the catheter and the securement device. And I think I, I only saw, I've only seen it once in, in training, but like it's the, it's the plane. So when there's tension on that line as you're doing the dressing change, maybe because there's infusions happening that you've got going on that's when i've seen it happen is that the right. weight of those extension lines or the lines of the infusion are pulling that tubing around and, and it was not observed in the moment of the dressing application so it's making sure that there was no no twisting distal to the secure cast um and that'll that'll be an important trick i've seen it in new inserters too who didn't align the dots as they're closing the lid have a twist in that point. And so it's really important not to open it um, before, you know, post insertion, because if the inserter has made sure it's aligned, it'll stay straight and then we keep everything in plane in the proper orientation after. All, all, all good points, Lana. Yep. These are great questions. This is fantastic stuff. Yes, can I ask one more? <laughs> yes, please. Um, so do you recommend, uh, do you guys have um, a recommendation when we're removing it? Is it, is it better to cut it or not cut it? Because you can do it both ways. Yeah, you, you can do it both ways. Um, I always teach to not using the cut method and just using the fold method. Um, however, the cut method is also a possibility to be used, but for sure, if you're ever going to be cutting it, the catheter should not be in place still. It should be taken out and then cutting after it's been removed. Um, but just talk just, about your personal preference, like when you've done it yourself. Talk, tell me about your experience, literally. Oh, um, well, I mean, it, it, okay, so we have had instances where uh, maybe there might be a uh, might be a little bit difficult to get out to, to remove the secure cath, right? And so we get called to say, hey, okay, what, what, what can we do? Um, sometimes if, if people say that they are having a hard time, most of the time, it's not actually a hard, it's not hard to remove. It's, uh, it's just that you have to know how to remove the device. And so, right, there's, there's two things here on the secure cath. There's the hold and there's the lift side. And then there's two pieces to the secure cath, right? Um, and so for maybe some of you that hadn't ju that jumped on late, right? There's the lid and then there's the base to it. Um, and so what I always attempt to do first, right? If I'm gonna be removing a catheter, let's just pretend that this has already been removed, okay? Um, but I'm gonna use the fold method. And so when I use the fold method, I'm folding it. I'm making sure that the blue part is as parallel with the skin as I can. And then I'm just pulling up with purpose. And that will allow me to remove the device, right? And the reason for that being parallel with the skin and pulling up with purpose um, is so that the feet are aligned with the insertion site so that it will allow the feet to come up right through the insertion site. Does that make sense? 
Now, if you had the cut method, um, some things that, you know, if you're having trouble being able to remove it, what the cut method can allow you to do is it can allow you to pull. So you know how you have to squeeze and, and cause the feet to come together, right? Let's say you weren't able to do that. Um, cutting it, let's just say this catheter is not here. Okay, we're cutting it down the middle and it will allow you to move the feet, you know, take it instead of folding it, um, it will allow you to pull the feet out one by one. So if it's this way, I can pull the feet out one foot out this way, and then I would be able to pull the foot out one, one side on this side. So um, there's benefits to both um, in cert certain situations that you'd be able to use those for. So oh, and you have your giant. And I'm going to just add to, I have my giant one here. I'm going to add to Matt's point there about um, the removal. So I too teach to the fold because I find that it's a lot less intimidating um, for the patient to see scissors coming at them, you know, at the end of their catheter. So we want to reduce the patient's anxiety and experience and, and be very, very confident. Super users are really important here and knowing knowing that there's training. And if you if the person who is removing it hasn't had training, using the resources we have available, watching the video, calling our hotline for coaching ahead of the removal is, is recommended. And, and I will reinforce that for everybody, not you necessarily, Lana, but for everybody in general. But when you get to the point where maybe you've already done that, you're an educated user and you strug you're struggling to remove it and you go, I need to cut this. Or maybe you visualize something that's unusual. Maybe somebody wasn't lifting it effectively and there's some hypergranulation that's very, very visualized on the skin itself. In that case, I would recommend cutting the device to separate. The design of the cut is really to make sure that the feet are separated for easier removal. And so once that's happened, what you can do is not just wiggle it out through the insertion site, but you can actually feel for that foot and put downward traction on it. And what happens is, is that it's designed to be prolapse. And so I'm using my jumbo one in the video here to, to, to show that, but you actually press on the skin to prolapse it as you're pulling traction on it. So it's a, it's a, it's a singular motion, but I'm just slow, slow mowing it. You're literally going like this. So you're pushing down and pulling up. Most often what we find is that the difficult removals is not a significant enough counter traction. So I'd almost say your orientation and, and, and grip and confidence on the removal is important, but it's your counter traction on the skin that's, that's really critical. I find that if you have your tr counter tractions too far away from the insertion site, or not firm enough, you're, you're gonna be pulling up on the skin and that's when it becomes uncomfortable for your patient. And, yeah. and, okay. and I'll just speak from my experience. Like we've, we placed, our team has placed thousands of these devices and I always get called for somebody that's having a difficult time. They're like, we can't get it out. And I haven't experienced Laura's, Laura's, um, Laura's situation of having to apply counter traction um, in order to remove it, but not, not saying that that's, that's not a thing and it doesn't, but I've always been able to remove a secure cath Um not not that difficult it's not like when you know how to remove it it's, it's not that difficult um and it makes it easy to remove so you right. just have but, to know how to right so there's a that's it's confidence level right so you're holding on to it and you really want to just do a one swift motion as opposed to oh honey I'll, I'll i'll be real gentle and that's where we run into problems i feel you're absolutely you're, right. you're absolutely right Perfect. too timid it's it has to be purposeful correct okay. Like I, I'm going to take you, you nailed out, it, and I'm going to I'm going to take it out. We're going to take it out. So, yes, good, good, good point. And that's again why I go back to super users are critical because they are the ones usually you're you're going to pick your super users if they're volunteering. They're they're usually the most confident people in the room. <laughs> So definitely we don't want to, and, and number one thing is not to twist it. Twisting it is not going to help the situation. Twisting and turning, it makes it very uncomfortable. And, and often the call we get at the hotline is after somebody has never seen it before, uh, starts twisting it because they think it's a corkscrew. And I, I always say, it's not a corkscrew. The only wine you're going to get is one that you can't have for drink. <laughs> so Everybody's on mute, so we can't hear the laugh. Thanks for the gratuitous giggle there, Matt. I appreciate it. <laughs> my, uh, my cheesy jokes were. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm, I've been trying to hold back on dad jokes. So, <laughs> <laughs> Lana, thanks for all your good questions, though. It, 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 it's good to have conversation and, you know, be able to talk about the device. And so I appreciate it. Thank you.
No, thank you. Um, I love it. <laughs> Great. And, we, and again, anytime we, we're going to have another call, I'm going to, before we close off here, I'm going to share that we have um, our next call on March 21st. If you have friends that have questions and miss this opportunity, we will be posting a video of these discussions um, shortly on our website. But the link for registration for next month's call is now in the chat, and we will post it also on our website in that register for the next event here later today. Um, so please share it with your friends and colleagues. Um, and we're, we're really grateful for everybody who joined and participated today. Thank you so much for your, um, your engagement and your questions. And feel free to send us other questions for next time. We, we look forward to engaging and ensuring that we're, we're making everybody more comfortable with Secure Cat. Thanks, Matt. You've done a great job sharing your experience and, and demos. I really appreciate you participating today. Um, it's yeah. now at the two o'clock hour. I'm going to give everybody one last chance to ask questions. I see there's still some folks hanging in there. Any other questions anybody has, feel free to unmute and ask them or post it in the chat. Thank you, Lana. I appreciate all your participation today. Thank you, guys. So, Laura, you'll anybody else? Yeah, yeah, I got I got your contact info. So thank you for that, Lana, in our private chat. I I'll make sure we get our rep in the area to follow up with you and get you all that information thank as you. soon as possible. Thanks, Matt. You're welcome. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Thanks, everybody. All right.